and welcome to the Flix Forum podcast, where each episode we go back and we look at a Netflix original film in the order of release. This is our 18th day of Podmas, where we're releasing an episode every day in the lead up to Christmas. Today, we have Netflix 286th film from 2020. It's the comedy horror, Vampires vs. the Bronx. This one's directed by Oz Rodriguez and stars Jaden Michael, Jared W. Jones III, Gregory Diaz IV, Sarah Gadon, Method Man, Shay Wiggum, and Coco Jones. I'm Jesse, I'm your host. Thanks for joining me as we head closer and closer and a week out till Christmas now. Wow, time's flying, December's going quick. As always, we are going to cover a film. If you haven't seen this film, Vampires vs. the Bronx, and you are keen on checking it out, give us a pause and come back later on because we're going to spoil it as we go. And we kick our show off with the fast flicks where we do a quick little summary of what the film is all about. So this one's about a group of African-American boys, and sorry, not just African-American boys, but a group of ethnic boys who are trying to save their neighborhood from vampire invaders or specifically white people. Um, this film, I was. This is a pretty big film, I think. Uh, like from memory, I remember seeing the posters for this film. I'm very surprised in how little I could actually find out about why this or how this film ended up on Netflix. All I can see is that this film was announced back in August of 2018, um, and that Broadway Video and Caviar had begun production on it. This film was written and directed by, as I mentioned before, um, Oz Rodriguez, and Universal Pictures was um, was was on board to make this film. We then head to September of 2020, where Netflix acquired the distribution rights from Universal Pictures, and that's how it ended up on Netflix uh, on the 2nd of October, 2020. So, um, you know, held onto it for a month, worked out how to promote it, and then there we've got it there. So this this film obviously is about vampires. There is so much lore about vampires in here that a lot of people would already know. There's a lot of good references as well. My favorite, I've got one reference that I really like about vampires here, that this is about a real estate company of vampires who are sort of purchasing um, land, sort of gentrifying the land in the Bronx. And one of them is called Murnay Enterprises, which is after F.W. Murnay, who directed um, Nesafaratu in 1922, which is sort of considered one of the first uh, vampire films. And I think um, Rod- um, Ed Eggers is making that film, a uh, remake of it, which is coming out soon as well. So, so that's exciting too. This is obviously filmed in and around the Bronx in New York City in America. What are the critics and audiences saying about this film? So on Rotten Tomatoes, this sits at 90%, which is certified fresh on 42 reviews. The audience, this is so different. 45%, so rotten on more than 250 ratings. Audience, not a big fan of this film. IMDb, 5.7 out of 10 on 11,000 ratings. Not too bad. Letterboxd, 2.9 out of 5, so still on that low end side um, with nearly 21,500 ratings, logged by about 28,000 people. This has a Metacritic score on that traffic light system, green, yellow, or red. The critics, it sits on green, 76 out of 100 on five critic reviews. Audience, a little bit lower, 4.6 out of 10, and that's on 17 reviews, so it sits in the yellow, not in the red, so a little bit of a mixed bag. So it looks like critics like it, audiences not so much. What are my thoughts on this one? Uh, I thought it was quite fun. I really enjoyed this film. It was, it was reminiscent of like a good Nick at Night type sort of film, or like, you know, good old goosebump sort of stories or narratives. But this one, this one, has, oh, I think it, it sort of showed on the screen that you could see how much effort had been put in, time and effort into this story, this narrative, the performances. It's a very explicit message, yes, but it's perfect for the teen target audience of this film, I think. So I think really well done all around, um, 90% of the time for this film. Let's talk about the characters in this one. Mixed bag of characters in this. So our main kid, his name's Miguel, um, nicknamed Little Mare. He's this charitable kid. We see that he's trying to raise money to help save this local bodega. Uh, he's got no luck with, with girls, really, because his mum seems pretty protective. The adults in his life, they don't believe in vampires, and he sort of reveals and thinks that they're real. And, you know, that idea... Of the, the parents also don't believe, I guess, that that idea that their neighbourhood's being taken over. They're, they're blinded to it, whereas the kids can see it. And he's super passionate, has big ideas, and, and manages to get his friends together on, on his mission as well. And, and his friends, I guess we talk about his friends, Lewis is um, this Puerto Rican kid. He's um, a kid that has that background knowledge on vampires and their lore and their folklore and that sort of stuff. He's sort of like the dweeb, I guess, of the group. Um, He gets low blood sugar levels. I'm not sure that that was really needed. It was more like a plot point, I guess, than a trait of a character. And then Bobby's the opposite. Bobby's um, a bit more hardcore. He's sort of targeted by local gangs to sort of join their crew and do crimes. He's been kicked out of school for behavior. And there's concerns from his family and his friends that 
he's going to turn out like his father who we, we hear has been incarcerated himself so sort of you know th- but that's that's i guess what happens in real life is that people are often forced into lives that that, that, that they don't really need or they, they do it because they have to because they need money to get by Tony. Tony is another main character in this film as well. He's the the owner of the bodega, which uh, Miguel's trying to save. It's like a home away from home for the kids in this film. The kids all love him. They hang out there. He's really kind to them, gives them credit in the store, that type of stuff. He's really a good male role model in this film because we don't really see the fathers of the other characters. We see their mothers, but this guy, Tony, sort of steps in as their father type role in this as well. Rita is this girl um, who sort of joins the boys at at some stage uh, on their quest as well. Then we talk about the vampires, I guess. Uh, Frank, Frank's the one, the main one I'll talk about. We've got Valerie as well, but Frank's the main one. He's this human doing all the vampires work for them, especially when they sleep during the day. He is used and abused by the vampires, I guess. So we, we sort of get a little bit of a development in his character because you know he wants to be a vampire one day and he's sacrificing everything to do that. But at the end of the day, he sacrifices himself for good in the end. So that, that's a nice little side character arc that we get as well. The Bronx. I've got to talk about the Bronx. The Bronx is a character in this film. That mix of cultures. It's like this forgotten area that's constantly mentioned as this this part that sort of like the a blight on on society and and the reason why no one cares about it. So I think that it plays a really important role in this film as well. The director, Oz Rodriguez, sixty four directing credits, a lot of TV episodes, and a lot of work on Saturday Night Live. Comedy looks to be where the focus is, which which is clear in this film when you see this film as well. Let's talk about some scenes in this film. What are the ones that I like? What are the ones I didn't like? A lot that I liked. I, to be honest, there's nothing that I didn't like. So I'm gonna just going to go with things that I enjoy. Lewis, this character, this this little dweeby sort of guy, he's referred to by some gang, mangers, some gang members as the Puerto Rican Harry Potter. I thought that was funny. The gangsters that we see in this film, they get a, one of them gets attacked in a car park and he's sort of talking to this vampire and he's like, you know, are you a lost Hamilton? I thought that was funny. Miguel, he warns um, these guys, just sort of sit on the corner out the front of Tony's shop often. He sort of says, oh, you know, be careful. There's lots happening. Keep your eyes open. And the guys are just like, that's super vague, dog. <laughs> I thought that was funny. There's the scene where the boys open coffins to see the vampires for the first time and trying to record them and get footage of them. And, and the phone goes off and one of them wakes. That was funny. That was hilarious. Uh, Vivian's this white person who's, who's a vampire and, and buying up some of the property. She goes to Tony's place to sort of hunt down Miguel and um, Tony realizes that she's a vampire and, and that the boys were telling the truth because he can't see her in his CCTV footage that, that's playing while she's in the store because he doesn't have a reflection. Uh, she doesn't have a reflection. I thought that was really well done. The boys, they, they, they go to church. They're in trouble. They feel, they go, they go into the back room of the church, into the priest's room and fill some bottles with holy water. And then the priest comes in looking for him. And he's like, oh, they stole my Sprite. <laughs> he's more worried about his Sprite than the boys uh, stealing holy water. I thought that was good. There's a fight at the end. That was pretty good. There was one moment where a shoe was thrown. I thought that was funny. Anytime a shoe's thrown, that's always good. And then finally, you know, they're victorious at the end and Miguel and Rita sort of have this connection and he goes in for a kiss and she's like, what are you doing? That wasn't that. And he's like, oh, sorry. That was funny too. I thought that was good. Themes, ideas in this one. So it's clear. This is really clear in this film. Gentrification, big, in your face, class warfare, class struggle, class tension, the idea of invasion, but then again, you've got that opportunity that people want to change their lives too. So it's, it's that, that that thing where home, this is home, but we want to change our lives. We want to better ourselves. And unfortunately, people have money to be able to try and sell that idea too, even though that's not the right thing to do. Um, racism. Racism is in this as well. That idea of evil, taking away from those with less, referring to their home as places that no one cares about. That's really sad too. And then, then you got to talk about the boys and, and the camaraderie that they show together. That, that idea of teamwork joining up, making them stronger together to tackle issues together. Friendship is obviously important too. Even if, you know, there are difficult times, you bounce back, friend, friends are meant to be there for you too. And, and we do see some kids, there's this girl, Gloria, who was constantly video blogging, sort of worked as a narrator in the film too, but that idea, kids' obsession with social media too, always streaming things, taking photos for evidence, those types of things, a, a different sort of world. What did I take away from this film? I think it's really hard not to think of anything Jordan Peele has sort of done over the last few years when watching this film, I think. And, and I think he must have inspired it in some way. You think about Get Out, you think about Us, even the film Candyman, the the, the remake of Candyman or the, the sequel of Candyman, that big focus on gentrification in that as well. They all tie in well together. This one is just, this film, Vampires vs. the Bronx, is clearly targeted at a much younger audience. And it's nice to see an accessible version of that same theme or that same idea for younger people. So... I thought that was really good. Now, I'm going to be, do we have a moment where we jumped on to check anyone out in the film? I didn't feel like a character, but Tony in his bodega, he's got this baseball bat, which 
it's very symbolic in the film because it, eventually it's used as, as a wooden stake to take these vampires out. But he, you know, I like baseball, so I was really interested in this character because this bat belongs to Sammy Sosa, who I had no idea who it was. So I looked up who Sammy Sosa was. So a Dominican um, American former professional baseball player. Um, he was a right fielder, played in the major leagues for 19 seasons, mainly with the Chicago Cubs, played with the Texas Rangers and the Chicago White Sox for a bit. And he joined the Cubs in 1992 and became regarded as one of the best hitters because he hit 60 runs in a season. So a nice little background story, a role model for these people in this community to a, a professional baseball player who they can look up to and say, there's there's that emblem of success as well. Um, I really enjoyed that, that reference. I thought that was good. Questions, ponderings. I think it's very clear. No one can mess with the Bronx. The Bronx is a place that you don't mess with. The people there love that place. They love each other. They love their community. They love their family. Just because others ignore them doesn't mean that they don't work together. I think that was really clear. And there's a scene where one of the vampires goes into Tony's shop and he picks up a bottle of hand sanitizer. I, in this post, or in this, not post, but in this uh, COVID world, I just thought that was uh, an interesting sort of reference for a film that looked like it went into production before uh, COVID officially hit. So I, th- I thought that was interesting too. Uh, I'm ready to wrap this up. We give the film a rating out of five. Like I've sort of touched on this whole time, I think it's got a really important message, but it's done in such an accessible way, especially for younger people, even if it is a bit in your face for, for people that don't enjoy being preached at, but I enjoyed it. I thought it was really good. Give this a four out of five. Four out of five for me, really positives. We've got socials, we've got Instagram, Facebook, and X, formerly known as Twitter. The question I want to put out there, and I don't know whether there's a chance of this happening, but would you be interested in watching more stories about Miguel and his friends? I'd love to see these guys adventuring around the Bronx updating the challenges of what they're facing, you know, in the 2023, 2024 world. I, I really like that. I, I found these kids really, you know, we didn't get an awful, awful lot of depth in relation to them, but their adventures are fun. It was just, it was, it reminded me a lot of those eighties films like ET and the Goonies friends banding together to work for a common, a common goal. And it was just nice. I thought it was good. All right. Maybe, maybe just after some of the international uh, films over the last few days that I'm sort of just really up and about about this one. We are back tomorrow though, and we do have another international film tomorrow. Tomorrow, it's from 2020. It's a Mexican film. It's a rom-com called You've Got This, or Ahi, T and Cargo. It's directed by Salvador Espinosa and stars Mauricio Ackerman and Esmeralda Pimentel. That's what we've got tomorrow. International film. Get on board. Give it a watch if you want to. I will see you tomorrow. Thanks as always for listening.